One day, Cornelius decided to take me to the encephalic section. He introduced me to the head of the department, a young chimpanzee called Helius, and apologized for not being able to show me round himself on account of some urgent work. Helius showed me into a room similar to those in the Institute. We walked past cages occupied by men and women of all ages. My stomach heaved from a succession of horrors. I saw men partially or totally paralyzed, others artificially deprived of sight. I saw a young mother whose maternal instinct, once highly developed, so Helios assured me, had completely disappeared after interference with the cervical cortex. She kept thrusting away a young child of her own whenever it attempted to approach her. This was too much for me. I thought of Nova, of her impending motherhood, and clenched my fists in rage. Luckily, Helios showed me into another room, which gave me time to recover my composure. Here, he said with a mysterious air, we indulge in more delicate research. It's no longer the scalpel that is brought to bear. It is a far more subtle medium. Electrical stimulation of certain points in the brain. Do you practice this sort of thing on Earth? Yes, on monkeys, I retorted in fury. The chimpanzee kept his temper and smiled. Cornelius, who had just come in, gave me a friendly tap on the shoulder. But you must admit that thanks to them, our medicine and surgery have made enormous progress in the last quarter of a century. This argument did not convince me any more than the memory I had of the same treatment applied to chimpanzees in a laboratory on Earth. Cornelius shrugged and dragged me off to a smaller room. Only two of us ever go into this room, he told me in a solemn tone. Helios and myself. So you see the importance I attach to this work. There were only two subjects, a man and a woman, lying strapped down on two parallel divans. All is well, said Helios. They are quite calm. We can embark on a test straight away. Helios anaesthetized the two patients and started up various machines. He then carefully unrolled the bandage which covered the man's skull and, aiming at a certain spot, applied the electrodes. The man remained absolutely still. I was questioning Cornelius with my eyes when the miracle happened. The man began to talk. His voice echoed round the room with an abruptness which made me start. He must have been captive in the Institute for a long time and kept repeating snatches of sentences he had heard spoken by the nurses or the scientists. Cornelius presently put a stop to this experiment. We'll get nothing more out of this chap, but the main point is he talks. It's amazing, I stammered. You haven't seen anything yet, said Helius. He talks like a parrot or a gramophone. But I've done much better with her. He indicated the woman who was sleeping peacefully. A thousand times better, said Cornelius, who betrayed the same excitement as his colleague. Helius has succeeded in awakening not only her own individual memory, but the memory of her species. I was so amazed by this extravagant claim that for a moment I really believed that the learned Cornelius had gone mad. But Helios was already handling his electrodes and applying them to the woman's brain. The latter remained inert for some time, just like the man. Then she heaved a deep sigh and started talking. For some time, said the anxious voice, these monkeys have been ceaselessly multiplying. We have been wrong to tame them and to grant those whom we use as servants a certain amount of liberty. The woman paused, heaved several anguished sighs, then went on. It's happened. One of them has succeeded in talking. I read about it in Woman's Journal. There's a photograph of him, too. He's a chimpanzee. A chimpanzee, the first, just as I thought, Cornelius exclaimed. After a long silence, the woman's voice continued in anguish. I was too frightened. I preferred to hand the place over to my gorilla. He had been with me for years and was a loyal servant. 
He started going out in the evenings to attend meetings. He refused to do any work. I was too miserable. I abdicated. I, I have taken refuge in a camp with other women who are in the same plight as myself. There are some men here as well. Most of them have no more courage than we have. We feel ashamed and barely speak to one another. Another feminine voice succeeded hers. I was a lady animal tamer. I used to do an act with a dozen orang-utangs, magnificent beasts. Today, I'm inside the cage instead of them, together with some other circus performers. To give them their due, the monkeys treat us well and give us plenty to eat. They change the straw on our bedding when it gets too dirty. They are not unkind. They punish only those of us who show reluctance and refuse to perform the tricks they teach us. I am not unhappy. I have no more worries or responsibilities. The woman fell silent, during which Cornelius gazed at me with embarrassing insistence. I could read his thoughts only too well. Had it not been high time for such a feeble race of men who gave in so easily to make way for a nobler breed? I blushed and looked away. I have a child. Nova has given birth to a boy. I know he is a splendid baby, but it is a month since I last saw him. The security measures have been tightened still more. Zira, who is suspect to the authorities, is under close surveillance. Cornelius has many enemies. He dares not frankly proclaim his discovery. Even if he thought of doing so, his superiors would no doubt be against it. The Orang-Utang clan, led by Zayas, is intriguing against him. They talk about a conspiracy against the Simeon race, and point me out more or less openly as one of the factionists. Cornelius is looking for me. There is something serious he wants to discuss. I follow him into the office, where Zira is waiting. Her eyes are red as though she has been weeping. They seem to have bad news for me, but neither of them dares to speak. My son? He's very well, Zira abruptly says. Too well, Cornelius mutters with a frown. He smiles. He cries like a baby monkey. And he has begun to talk. At three months old? I am delighted. Zira is annoyed by my doting father manner. But don't you realize this is a disaster? The others will never leave him at liberty. Your son is going to be placed in a sort of fortress under the surveillance of the orang-utans. Zayas has been intriguing for some time, and he is going to get the better of us. I am dumbfounded. It is not possible to leave my son in the hands of that dangerous imbecile. It is not only the child that is menaced, says Cornelius abruptly. I am very much afraid that within the next two weeks the council might decide to eliminate you, or at least remove a part of your brain on the pretext of some experiment. Zira puts her hand on my shoulder. You must get away. You must go back to where you belong on earth. Your son's safety and your own demand it. Her voice breaks as though she's on the verge of tears. I am also deeply upset. No less at her sorrow than at the thought of leaving her forever. But how to escape from this planet? Cornelius has a plan. Your spacecraft is still orbiting round our planet. An astronomer friend of mine has tracked it down and knows every detail of its trajectory. Now, listen. In exactly ten days' time, we are going to launch an artificial satellite, manned by humans, of course, on whom we want to experiment the effects of certain rays. No, don't interrupt. The number of passengers will be limited to three. One man, one woman, and a child. You three will take the place of the passengers. I've already got the necessary accomplices. The others won't even notice the trick that's been played on them. I take the opportunity of thanking Cornelius with all my heart. Inwardly, I'm wondering why he's doing all this for me. He reads my thoughts. Zira is the one you ought to thank, he says. It's to her you owe your life. On my own, I don't know if I should have taken so many risks, and anyway... He pauses... Zira is waiting for me in the corridor outside. He makes sure she cannot hear and quickly whispers. Anyway, for her as well as for me, 
It is better that you should vanish from this planet. He closes the door after me as I leave the room. I am alone with Zira. I take her in my arms. I see a tear coursing down her muzzle while we stand locked in a tight embrace. We are about to kiss like lovers when she gives an instinctive start and thrusts me away with violence. While I stand there, speechless, not knowing what attitude to adopt, she hides her head in her long, hairy paws and bursts into tears. Oh, darling, it's impossible. It's a shame, but I can't. I can't. You are really too unattractive. We have brought it off. I am once again traveling through space aboard the cosmic craft, rushing like a comet in the direction of the solar system at an ever-increasing speed. With me are Nova and Sirius, the fruit of our interplanetary passion. We have been traveling for more than a year and a half of our own time. Nova is bearing the voyage extremely well. She is becoming more and more rational. Her motherhood has transformed her. She spends hours doting on her son, who is proving to be a better teacher for her than I was. As for Sirius, he is the pearl of the cosmos. He walks despite the heavy gravity and babbles without stopping. The sun is growing bigger every moment. I try to distinguish the planets in the telescope. I can find my bearings easily. I can see Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and... And the Earth. Yes, here is the Earth. Tears come to my eyes. I know after seven hundred years I shall find neither parents nor friends, but I can hardly wait to see proper men again. We have entered the atmosphere. Nova looks at me and smiles. My son stretches his arms out and opens his eyes in wonder. Below us is Paris. The Eiffel Tower is still there. After seven hundred years' absence, I managed to land at Orly, which has not changed very much, at the end of the airfield, fairly far from the airport buildings. A vehicle approaches. It is a truck, a fairly old-fashioned model, four wheels and a combustion engine. I should have thought such vehicles had been relegated long ago to museums. The truck stops fifty yards from us. I pick up my son in my arms and leave the launch. Nova follows us after a moment's hesitation. She looks scared. She will soon get over it. The driver gets out of the vehicle. He has his back turned to me. He is half concealed by the long grass growing in the space between us. He opens the door for the passenger to alight. He is an officer, a senior officer, as I now see from his badges of rank. He jumps down. He takes a few steps towards us, emerges from the grass, and at last appears in full view. Nova utters a scream, snatches my son from me, and rushes back with him to the launch, while I remain rooted to the spot, unable to move a muscle or utter a sound. He is a gorilla. Michael Maloney was reading the final part.